திருச்சிட்டம் பலம் தெளிவு குருவின் திருமேணி காண்டல் தெளிவு குருவின் திருநாமம் செப்பல் தெளிவு குருவின் திருவார்த்தை கேட்டல் தெளிவு குருவுரு சிந்தித்தல் தானே பத்தராய் பணிவார்கள் எல்லார்க்கும் அடியேன் பரமனையே பாடுவாரடியார்க்கும் அடியேன் சித்தத்தை சிவன் பாலே வைத்தார்க்கும் அடியேன் திருவாரூர் பிறந்தார்கள் எல்லார்க்கும் அடியேன் முப்போதும் திருமேனி திண்டு வார்க்கடியேன் முழுநீறு பூசிய முனிவர்க்கும் அடியேன் அப்பாலும் அடிச்சாந்தார் அடியார்க்கு மடியேன் அரூரன் அரூரில் அம்மானுக்காலே குட் மார்னிங் எவ்ரி ஒன் ஐ ஹாவ் த ப்ரிவிலேஜ் ஆஃப் ஃப்ளெக்சிபிலிட்டி இன் மை ஸ்பீச் ஜஸ்ட் டே ஐ talked about uh, our scriptures understanding of our scriptures vedas and agamas what is vedas what is agamas and uh, anyone uh, was there for the yesterday's lectures can you please raise your hands and just to see okay so that's one part so now i have the privilege of moving to another topic oh just to Mm. while complimenting and uh, commenting on the efforts and uh, success of this conference i can go on to supplement some of the information you have been gathering since just today and today's sessions it's been great uh, pleasure to see and witness i have been uh, involved in this uh, saiva hindu spiritual things uh, guided by my shiva all those things uh, i immediately delegated to whoever who is the who, to whom it belongs to whoever pays respect to you that respect is not for us is for the lord within us who has been making us to act in that way so the honor should go him ella pogalam iravanake that we should immediately offer that mentally to him and also whoever receives what do you call it uh, paying the respect also thinks in a way this respect or obeisance is not for this particular person but for the lord within him who has been acting through him so that it act itself becomes a, a puja that's one of the simple explanation in the way so i have the, i've been involved um, uh, by god grace and my guru's grace um, and been not part of any particular religious organization or group uh, um, particularly but been involved in many temples and uh, involved with the teaching the youngsters and uh, conducting satsangs for different groups and visiting um, our homeland sri lanka north and east and uh, in the central hill country and in colombo and uh, meeting different people teachers and religious leaders and coming to uk this is not the first time this is the third time for the religious uh, thing and uh, what the things i observe here is i proudly say is not for the just for the words of price but i really observe this is a, uh, here is uh, i've seen it's emerging as a sort of a uh, what do you call global um, our spiritual cyber spiritual um, what do you call role model or if not the leadership is evolving from here i can witness that the beautifully one of the things i ex- example this is what you called uh, the temple um, committee members they themselves is participating 
in the prayer songs and singing and the prayers. That's one of the beautiful things I observed. And also the, our Sivacharyas and priests, and uh, they were also very involved with the temple member, the committee as well as with the devotees. And they're also part of the group uh, there. Uh, and also, um, yesterday it was mentioned by our grateful speaker, Suki Siva. You will listen to him uh, this afternoon. And he mentioned that what he called the Saivaism, unfortunately, uh, lacks or missed a leader like Ramanuja of Vaishnavism, who made a place, an equal place, in the temple, in the Sanctum Sanctorum, for both for Tamil Divya Prabandham and Vedic uh, mantras. But I am seeing here in UK, in the temple yesterday in the uh, conference, and also Highgate uh, uh, Murugan Temple, and also here, the Tamil Tirumurai songs are sang in par with the Sanskrit Vedic mantras and by the devotees, by the temple committee members, as well as by Shiva Sharyas. So I think uh, uh, in UK you are making the lead. I am very proud to see that. And to comment about youngsters, um, even though not, uh, what do you call, we don't see what do you call, we don't go by the numbers. Uh, whoever, uh, what do you call, so ready for that, the Lord will send them. It's the Lord section. Uh, but it's a commentable uh, speech by the group of youngsters yesterday, I observed. They are the pillars. Uh, we can rest our faith on them. And also the uh, youngsters this morning, uh, they are the pillars. They will be taking this mission further, I'm sure. So coming to that, uh, uh, making some supplement information on the information we get it from yesterday uh, and today. Uh, one of the information, yesterday one of the talk given by the youngsters, they talked about Kasivadi uh, Sintinadayar, the Sai White scholar, writer of um, 19th century and early 20th century. And uh, he is, uh, what do you call, his works of Magnum Opus is, uh, one is uh, his uh, commentary on Sivanyana Bodham in Tamil, and also he's the one translated uh, Brahma Sutra. Brahma Sutra as Nila Kanda Pasha. That is the uh, explanation for Brahma Sutra as for cyber it philosophy. I did that, and uh, with some other works. And uh, there was a term Kasi Vasi. What is Kasi Vasi means? Uh, they said that they have a whole, because he lived in Kasi for a long term. The Kasi Vasi is the name whoever resides in Kasi for one, uh, what do you call it, full 10 months, what's called one Garpakala. Uh, their fetus in the mother's womb stays for 10 months. So uh, whoever who stays and resides in Kadi, Kasi for 10 months, he, they can add the title the suffix Kasivasi, that's what it claims, just for the information. And also, uh, they talked about Tirumandiram. In Tirumandiram, there is a song about the fetus and about the, what you call, getting the babies uh, with the defects and other thing. It says, Madha Udaram Malamehil Mandana. Mada Udaram Salamehil Mungaya. This is the Tirumandiram songs. And uh, many of the traditional explanations uh, says that uh, at the time of union of the father and mother, uh, if there is uh, what he called, uh, they have uh, what he called more fecal matter in the colon, also the full of fecal matter, then that affects the fetus. And if there's a urine affect the fetus, that's the general explanation. But as a medical doctor, um, I see a different explanation here. We call it a fetal distress. The, in Tiruvasakam, the, it says at the time of delivery, it's very hard thing. It Takka, Tasamadi, Tayodu, Tanbadam, Tukka, Saharat, Tuyaridai, Pulaitam. It's a sort of a uh, very crucial moment of three, four minutes. The baby comes through the birth canal 
and uh, it descends at, at the stage before it emerges out of the birth canal. The umbilical cord blood supply was completely cut off. There's no umbilical blood supply or oxygen. And the baby hasn't taken its first breath to get the oxygen. So that is a crucial period for the baby. So if there any, any prolongation or delay in that part of labor, that's the second stage of labor, the fetus coming out, the descent and the turn and the medically. So that will affect the fetus. Fetus goes into the state of hypoxia. Hypoxia means the lack of oxygen in the fetal bloodstream, thereby the brain and the developing brain suffer from lack of uh, oxygen. It's all hypoxic encephalopathy. When this happens, the born fetus may be born with the damaged brain, with the obvious defects like cerebral palsy, and uh, intellectual deficiency and uh, developmental delay you could observe from the very early days of the fetus. Or sometimes this very subtle damage, it won't be obvious until very late in the school years or even after that, as about sort of, sort of uh, lacking some soft skills of learning or some form of very mild and uh, very subtle intellectual deficiencies or behavioral problems. That's, you can understand. So what happens here is, the baby, when there's a fetal distress, usually the baby doesn't pass its uh, uh, feces, the malum, until it comes out. At, uh, that's within the bowel, it's, uh, the fecal matter is there for the baby. Baby doesn't pass its uh, fecal matter uh, before birth. That is very unusual. But if it happened, this fetal distress of three, four minutes, if it is prolonged and the lack of hypoxia, so in the peak of fetal distress, the baby may pass the fecal matter. Then, the amniotic fluid, it's stained with the fecal matter. We call it meconium stained or meconium stained. That is a sign of fetal distress. And sometimes baby can aspirate that and we call it meconium aspiration. These babies need special attention and care uh, immediately after birth and thereafter and special monitoring. So, mother udaram means here udaram means not the bowel, it's the womb and the birth canal because we get sahodaram. Sahodaram means whoever born with the same, from the same womb is sahodaram. Sahamanavan, whoever studied in, with the same class is sahamanavan. So ha, sa, udaram means not only the bowel, it also implica uh, um, indicates the uterus and the birth canal. So here the fetus, uh, the fecal matter, malam is not of the mothers, but of the fetus. It passed before the birth and stain the aspiration, but it could make uh, amniotic fluid. It risk of, it's a sign of fetal distress. This child has the tendency to develop these things in the future. So, Madha, Udaram, Malam, Mihil, Mandana. That is the Mandana. Then Madha, Udaram, Salam, Mihil, Mungaya. Mungaya means that they call the, the, but they cannot talk, and uh, that also has a form of deficiency. Some form of uh, illness, especially the, the blood incompatibilities, and some other forms, what happens is uh, the fetal amniotic fluid, the fluid around the fetus within the womb, it's, uh, it's contributed by the urine of the baby within the womb. They just constantly drink that fluid, constantly pass urine, it's a part of the circulation. So it's, it's part of that. In certain um, um, circumstances, like RH incompatibility, the blood group incompatibility, and some other medical conditions, what happens is they call the, the developed the excess of this amniotic fluid is, uh, comes is called polyhydramnios. That also indicates the baby is in trouble, especially in the developmental problem, developmental delay, and other things. So, Madha, Udaram, Salam, Mikhil, Mungaya. So, this is a uh, uh, more compatible with the modern day medical interpretation of that particular Trimandran song. Just to the one more clarification. Uh, thanks for taking this song. Thanks for taking these songs uh, uh, for the explanations. Uh, this, 
uh, for these youngsters. Then the, there was a talk about Vedas and other things, and uh, it was mentioned uh, some of the part of Vedas. Vedas are words of God, as per Saivism. I don't want to go into it again, but uh, whoever has any doubts on the thing, you can ask me personally when I have time afterwards, uh, or ask in the question and answer of uh, sessions or uh, parallel session we have in the afternoon. The Vedas are words of God. As such, we don't expect any nonsense in them. That's true. Marahal is and sol, that is Sivanyana Siddhiyar. Arangam nal veda manai pochi, that is the Thirinavakara Sarvat. So we don't expect any nonsense in Vedas. Uh, they are sacred and they are revelation by the God. But only our interpretation, our explana uh, explanation, or our perception may be not that mature enough. With these, the, all these scriptures, our religion, all these scriptures, they don't have a direct meaning straight away. This is a meaning to give away. They have layers of understanding as per our spiritual maturity and evolution. The Watsal and uh, this morning gave a great talk because it is an evolution of the spiritual, our journey. And spirit won't evolve, it won't change. But the, uh, what do you call it? So the spiritual intelligence evolves. Spiritual intelligence evolved. That's a maturity. The spirit won't mature. Spirit won't evolve. Because atma aliyadu, valaradu, teyadu, sahadu. That's a thing. So, in this journey, when the same scripture gives different layers of understanding for us at different stages of life uh, for different people. So, we may not come to the complete understanding until the final stage. That is one with the God. Because who is the one that is the embodiment of Vedas, embodiment of knowledge. So in comes to that, that's fun explanation is what you call Vedic translation we have now available. One of the famous one with the Griffiths translation by Vedic literatures, all four Vedas uh, translated uh, by Mr. Griffith, one of the English person and some other people. It's available now in English translation, all four Vedas available, Rig, Jajur, Sama, Adarvana. And also their Tamil translation from the English, not directly from the Sanskrit. The English are uh, available of the Griffith translation also now available in print. People can buy it and read it. And when reading through that, these are only guidelines. We don't have how authentic are these translations. To interpret a Vedic uh, literature, uh, there are um, auxiliary texts for Vedas. We need to go through that. Among the six auxiliary, the Anga Nolkal R, the six box, uh, among them, four are dedicated to the language. The one is called Shiksha. Shiksha is a phonetic and pronunciation and accent of these mantras. The second is Vyakarana. Vyakarana is grammar and thesaurus and all those things. Nirukta is a philology and etymology. The words, what does it mean? And Chanda is the meter or prosody. These four parts deal with the language, pure language. So unless one goes through this, it's very difficult to interpret Vedas to its closest meaning. One example, Pasu, the word Pasu. Pasu means different meaning. Pasu means, uh, what's it called, a cow. Means the female uh, cattle that we have, that the Pasu, that we call it. And also, you know, even the buffalo, the female cattle is called Pasu. That is second meaning. Uh, third thing is, pasu can mean all the cattle, whether male, kali, the bull, another thing also can be called as pasu. And the pasu can uh, indicate any animals, any animals. Some people say pasupati is a lot of animals. Something. And also, pasu may indicate our animal instincts or spiritual dirts. That's something because pasu pali da paravandiya prani. It's a sacrificial animal. That means in the Vedic mantra says what is pasu means all our animal instincts we need to sacrifice. That's what the pasu means. Pasu also means the root word pach. Pach means which it is bonded, which it is bonded. So anything is bonded pasu. Thereby pasu means this, our souls is already bonded state from the. Time eternal, it is already bonded with the three fetters or spiritual dirt. So that is puzzle. So 
when there is a word pasu comes we need to know which pasu that place indicates for that they need to go so the translation is not very easy so all these translations are great work we have to pay our tribute to those uh, translators at the same time we need to uh, go bit cautiously in taking those translations that's one of the things so interpretation of vedic literature uh, is good but it is a bit tricky because we need to be aware of these uh, shortcomings in approaching the current available translation of vedic literature then um it's not mentioned here but it's raised in the social media and uh, platform that's and they criticize one of the mantras they we recite in our hindu weddings vedic mantras it says the first uh, you became wife to soma the second you became wife to i think uh, gandharva the third became agni and fourth now you becoming wife to me and some people interpret it a very uh, rude and nakli way and saying that this is the way you get a girl she's already with three people before but another thing that's a very superficial and nasty uh, criticism on one of the vedic mantras the meaning is the first part is soma soma means the moon the moon or in tamil called madhi it's it's the indication of our intelligent mati is intelligent the moon in astrology also represents our intelligence and thing so the first part of our life first part of our life is our development of our intellectual thing the child start to learn even simple thing learn to eat learn to turn the body learn to crawl learn to stand up learn to ask for the thing learning the language learning the facial expressions so many things the child learns and then the once you come to the stage you start schooling and learning the first part of our child is dedicated for learning that is married to soma we say some people we say he is married to his profession don't we say that in english he married to his profession means he is always concerned person involved with that that's the first part soma the second part is kandarva that yesterday i mentioned part of the sabveda is called kandarva veda kandarva veda means all our fine arts the music dance the decoration the kolam and the garlands making the garlands decorating the home the uh, nice cooking all those things the kandarva veda so they become expert in that when the child becomes when they grow when they come to the age of 8 9 10 then they get into that learning the what you call the art of all the fine arts the music the dance and the, uh, decorating the house and making nice food and serving and so all those things so that's the second part the marry to gandharva third part is agni agni is pure and purification of everything and she become very strong with wisdom and determination and forbearance all the spiritual qualities she develops so going through these three phases intellectual development and uh, involvement and development of the arts and uh, music and uh, um, what do you call home science and home running and then come to the spiritual qualities and then she becomes wife to that person that's the interpretation correct interpretation of vedic mantra for your information also yesterday they were talked about varnashrama dharma and sanyasa and thing Uh, sanyasa is the what he called most uh, honored position in our religion not only our religion another religion too ascetic life why because they are dedicated to the lord to the lord's works and lord service 24/7 we all do our work manage our temples and uh, family and everything but our involvement is part time we don't dedicate 24/7 but the two sectors of people one sanyasi other one is swacharya so brahmins they dedicated uh, themselves for 24/7 that mean 24 hours a day 7 days a week always in the lord service they cannot go on strike they cannot stop working 
and they can't do any other work. Do you imagine? They can't do any other work. That's why the highest place um, given for them um, in our religion. That's one of their understanding. Why do we uh, give this high place for our priest and Brahmins and also uh, for uh, sannyasis and gurus? That's another thing. That's most um, And again, saying that Saiva is slightly different. Uh, uh, unlike uh, what do you call Viveka Chudamani, that's uh, one of the great work of uh, Adi Shankara. I think second or third song, it says uh, it's rare to be born as a human being. Even then it's rare to be born as a male. And even then it's rare to be born as a Brahmin. And even then it's rare to learn Vedas. And even then it's rare to practice what you have learned in Vedas. Even then it's rare to attain Jnana. That's, uh, uh, that's uh, he explained about jnana. Indirectly, he indicates what he called jnana is only for the males, and jnana is only for the uh, Brahmins. That's uh, in those days, even in Brahma Sutra Pasha, he is mentioned that, and Swami Vivekananda mentioned that. But it's a great, respectful uh, saint. But this was the uh, things there at that time. But in Saivism, our uh, Saiva Siddhanta, if you see our Periya Pranam, our 63 saints, we have ladies there. Mangir Karasiyar was there. Isanyaniyar was there. And Karakkalamiyar was there. They, also, they were the lady saints. That's one of the revolutionary things. And there are many things there, but these are the few things to mention. And also, uh, we do have people from all walks of life. One person was a potter, one person was a washerman, one person was a hunter, one person was a fisherman, one person was a butcher. Uh, so different walks of life. And they were kings, they were ministers, they were uh, Brahmins, and Brahmins in the civil service, like Surat Thunder and thing. So military service. Uh, so these different walks of life uh, people, they attain jnana, a uh, lot of feet of the God. And one important thing is they haven't given up anything. They are just conducting their ordinary life as you and me do. They still have their family. They are still running their business. The fishermen still go for still go for fishing. The hunters still go for hunting. The butchers still butchering the animals and selling the meat. But still able to attain this jnana without changing anything, without changing the uniform, without giving up anything. And only two of them were sannyasins. One is uh, Murti Nayana, another one is Tirunavakarasar. Among 63, only two of them were sannyasins. That is the revolutionary revelation of Saivam to our community. It reassured us to be a jnani, and uh, to be a guru, we have all have our mental pictures. Jnana should be so nice, so pure, and so calm. He doesn't have any angry. He's a uh, very, uh, the Nadandal uh, Pullam Chaha. This is the description is there, even Bhagavad Gita. Krishna described about all these qualities of jnanis. Amanidvam. That means uh, there's no pride. Uh, and Adam, Adam Param, there's no uh, Anahankara, Adam Param Ilam and uh, seclusion in lonely places, and uh, always seeing the, what you call the uh, sufferings of life, and uh, what you call getting vairagyam, that is detachment from that. First of all, it's called, it's called uh, uh, the, our illness and uh, all those things, and they, they need to see always and uh, what they call Indriya Deshu Vairagyam. Vairagyam, that's getting the Vairagyam. Uh, and uh, not relishing in the material world. Whatever that comes, they came to the calm and quiet mind. They don't get angry and they don't get uh, uh, frustrated and other thing. But when you come to Periyapranam, we see a completely different picture. Even though there are saints like that, but some of them are not like that, like you and me. We are talks about the, we come to the Lord and serve the Lord and we get angry, we get frustrated, 
we shout we do behave bad behave mad sometimes sometimes i told my wife ask oh you talk all those things on the radio and uh, uh, meetings and uh, are you saying this or are you behaving like this because we were like that but still there is a reassurance from periya pranam if we pay our love and uh, devotion to the lord we are also guaranteed of liberation that is one of the uh, what do you call main diversion from any other faith in the world and including from other sub faiths along hinduism in saivism that's a one of the things i need to make a different um i need to mention that different and there's also the mention about uh, yesterday a uh, few speakers mentioned about uh, samanam jainism and uh, we always uh, talks about it all uh, someone there did this and uh, they attack jains and they fought with jains they argued with jains and triumphed over jains and uh, reestablished what is wrong with jainism now we are living in a multicultural society when we teach these things to our kids they will ask or oh, what the horrible thing you did or your forefathers did so jainism is a beautiful religion it's wrong it says we call all these religions in our indian philosophical system is called darshanas darshanas mean the envisions they all searching for the truth but they see the truth to that extent only even the atheism that it's called logai the logai them says there is no god did you see the god there's no god no karma no pavan no punyam just life is short enjoy this life and go that's his uh, lokayadam even lokayadam itself considered as a darshana in, the, in our philosophical system because they also search for the truth but the truth they perceive is only that much for the jains they accept karma they accept rebirth but one of the thing is what they call they insist on turavu uh, you what they call you leave your home and you leave your family uh, to get liberated until the time you will be born and born and early jain days uh, what they call there was no liberation for the ladies ladies should be born as males then buddhism came that smashed that ladies also involved they absorbed that but both of them there's no place for the god there's no place for the god there is karma there is liberation and births and these things you follow certain teachings of their what you call tithangarar in the um, jains and the thing and uh, buddha in buddhism but what went wrong is when they get this uh, socio political power and they started abusing that power they started harassing the other religions mainly the, that is a saivism at that time then then we look into the harassment and uh, assassination attempts by the jains on our saint upper swami they try to poison him they try to kill him uh, the elephant uh, and they try to put him in a our a lime kiln and then at last they tied him with a rock and throw him in the ocean so he himself documented in his songs it's not imaginary thing he himself documented in his songs so when we see these thing is it a religion is it dharma so at that stage they started attacking so acharya lakshana who talks about guru as so watson talks about guru the guru and the acharya lakshana is two one thing is an acharya one one who should strengthen the faith among the his followers our faith in our hindu in our saivism we talks to our people to strengthen our people's faith and practice that's one part that is swiya mada sthapana then the other part of the acharya or guru is paramada kandana when the other religions start attacking us at saying this what you practice is wrong what you are worshiping is a false god or you are idol worshipers Uh, your concept of god is not right it's mine is the only one writing then we stand up and uh, what do you call it oppose them that is the paramada kandana 
So these two are the, uh, what we call, qualities of a guru or acharya as outlined in our scriptures. So our saints, Samandar, Aparswamikal, Manika Vasaka, they did that. And that's the way they encountered Jainism or Samanam, otherwise Samanam is what he called, is also accepted as a part of the, what he called, um, search for the truth and accepted as an envisioning the truth. Um, then the, what do you call it, Satguru. Uh, Watson made a very good talk about Satguru uh, and he mentioned that uh, religious leadership uh, among the Saivism is missing because we don't have a Satguru as such. Uh, but be cautious of searching the Satguru as well. Nowadays, uh, Satguru is uh, what do you call, I, you may know that too. Another thing, some of the Satgurus uh, coming in the first class travel, staying in the five star hotel, and uh, big conference uh, rooms uh, booked, and uh, they offer and grace you with certain dukshas and sometimes muktis as per your payment. Yes, it happens. There are tickets, there are payments. They do visit uh, home visits for so many dollars or pounds and uh, personal blessing. First, this is uh, open to everyone. They have a small thing, so it's okay. Everyone, then they sing and they talk and other thing. But then the next step is that, what do you call, you need to pay certain things and other things. So we should be aware of it. In our tradition, there's no fixed fee, only dakshana. When we go to the temple or another thing, nowadays system is different, but what we do is every one of us give our best and best of our abilities to our gurus or doctors. Now, in those days, to get any service, even if you go to the doctor, you do the same in those days. But nowadays it's different, but we need to be aware of it. When there's a red flag, what I say in medical terms, red flags is there. Certain red flag signs or symptoms the patient uh, shows, then we need to be aware of it. It could be something else, it could be something serious. And we do be cautious and watching and doing extra tests. Like that in spirituality also there are red flags. If there is a predetermined money involved, of course we need to support them. They are 24-7 in here. So we need to support them for their living, their shelters, their food and their travel and all those things. But if there is an extraordinary amount of money involved, it's a predetermined fee involved, that's a red flag in spirituality. So be aware of that, those uh, moving, uh, flashy Satgurus in these days who label them and claim them as Satguru. That's another thing. And uh, uh, so the Tamil, uh, yo, that we leave there. And uh, then the Guru, uh, he mentioned at last, the Varsalanda, so when the soul is ready, Guru will appear. That Guru is the Lord Himself. Lord Himself. This is the last Guru. Guru the Supreme. Mani Vasagar says that Guru Mani than the Alvarka. Mani means the gem, the Supreme. There is no Guru needed after that. There is nothing to be known after that because all known by the time. So that the last. The Lord Himself comes as a Guru. How does it come as a Guru? He takes the form of human body. Who is the human body in the tame of the Guru, whoever it is who is there? And his soul, the Guru's soul, the Lord takes as a temporary body. It's called Saitanya Sarira. And he grace and he blesses the devotee through that Guru. It's not that Guru is having a personal power, he can do some magic and other things. It is the God who uses and utilizes the human Guru, soul, as his body and blessing him. That is the last Guru when we reach the door. But until that time, we need to have several Gurus. We need to have Guru to, what do you call, learn the alphabets at Charambam. We need to have an English Guru, we need to have a Tamil Guru, a Guru for the physics, Guru for the chemistry, Guru for the professional courses like uh, medicine, law, and all those things, a Guru for the Bharatanatyam, Guru for the music, all those things are Gurus. But ultimate Guru, the Supreme, who is showing the sand mark, the path to God, will come at last. So, so never hesitate. Some people ask to what they call how to get the diksha and other thing. The basic of all equation is whoever having the faith, whoever having the faith and whoever practices that, whoever chanting the mantra, he is going to give 
uh, something by himself, he is qualified to be a basic guru. So take that and the only the God is the one directing to. So don't wait for some what do you call Lord Shiva himself comes and says, Kuru, until that time I will wait another thing. We need to do this thing, we need to take our mantra, we need to take our diksha, we need to learn our yoga, our pranayama, our meditation, our puja, and all those things we need gurus. That's one thing. And also, uh, Kumaran with a beautiful explanation of the five elements and uh, temples of five elements. It's a great explanation, and he dwelt into the what he called the scientific explanation of that thing. So very good, and also a form of Nadaraja. Form of Nadaraja is also layers of understanding. The dance of Shiva is um, perceived by Prichu of Capri. That was the inscription there in the CERN, Center for Nuclear Research in Europe in Switzerland. And uh, with, under the statue, huge statue of dance of Shiva. And the dance of Shiva perceived as the movement of this cosmic world. The dance of Shiva perceived as the particles of subatomic particles. So all these things are moving, right? All these are the electron, protons are moving, and the planetary system is moving, our universe is uh, moving, and uh, this constant move is called the gross dance, Thula Nadana. That is only one aspect of the Naraj dance. The second thing dance is called Thula uh, Nadana, then the, the Shukshuma or subtle dance. The subtle dance happens within himself, his actions, his will. There is a movement within him. He is not a still and do, not doing nothing. And that itself, the dance within him, that's the second subtle dance. And third dance is happening in Nadana, each and every soul. He dances on each and every one of us, our soul. This is called Jnana Nadana. This is three basic explanations. There are further explanations. The dance is there for the, the, the souls also are liberated. Constantly it's happening. The dance is there for the souls who have never taken birth yet, that waiting for that who are in the, covered by the darkness of ignorance, anava. So all these uh, different uh, forms of dance is there, well explained in the uh, Agamic textures. But it's, there are many more dimensions of Lord dance. It never ceases. Incessant dance of Lord Shiva. It's always happening. And uh, that's uh, one of the explanations. And... Um, the five elements, and uh, there is also called the what do you call elements? We called it, and also energy. So we called uh, our goddess Shakti. So Shakti means power. If you want to worship Shakti, the most powerful one, to whom we, uh, where do we need to go? I think we need to go to a nuclear plant. Because the nuclear power is the most powerful, as more dreadful, as more fearful, and if you utilize correctly, it's most useful energy form. So why don't we go to the nuclear plant and worship instead of worshiping in the temple? A lot of destruction happening on the backside, right? <laughs> So any questions, uh, what do you call it? any uh, uh, answers like that? Why do we, uh, what's the difference between the Shakti we worship and the Shakti we see in the electricity, we see in the atomic power, we see in the magnetic field, electromagnetic field, all those things. What's the difference? Huh? They are dangerous. Our Shakti is not dangerous? Huh? Nuclear things, okay. What else? You have to? Yeah, so um, what I'm asking is what is the difference between that energy or Shakti and the Shakti we worship in our religion? Yeah, so why don't we worship a nuclear energy with love and devotion? Why? Good. Anything, any other explanation? Yeah. 
Yeah. Sure, nuclear biocells here, energy we use for, but we can use those energy for useful too. For example, electricity, we light this uh, area, we heat these things, so the good uh, utilization too. At the same time, the same Shakti is used for destruction by Lord Shiva, dissolution. So, One destroy. So perception, if we think that, but that's a, one of the other things. We think creation is a good thing, destruction is a bad thing. Destruction is also a good thing because it leads to the degeneration, uh, regeneration again. Imagine they, we eat food. If it not, if not get digested and excreted, what would happen? Imagine it's stagnant, it smells, it stings. So destruction is also. Uh, five minutes for me, okay. Uh, destruction is also part of the Lord's work. Many people are afraid of destruction, but not. It's a, it's a part of the, what do you call, two sides of the coin. That's why we chant Sri Rudram in temple, where it worship Rudra both as a protector as well as as a destroyer. Both as a representative of all the goods in the world and also the bad in the world. That's the other level of spiritual understanding. Simply come into that. The energy, the nuclear energy, electricity, electromagnetic energy, magnetic energy, all those forms of energies are inert. They are jada sakti. They don't have feelings. They don't have any sense. They don't have any knowledge. Suppose a fire outbreak in this building. Now it happens if we take it. Does it know uh, these people are good people, these people are bad people, and we shouldn't touch them, we shouldn't spare the kids, and we should only attack the bad people? No. Because it doesn't have any knowledge, the fire. The electricity is the same. The nuclear energy is the same. It doesn't discriminate because it doesn't have intelligence, it doesn't have sense. It is jada sakti, just inert. But the Shakti we worship is full of conscious, full of intelligence. That is called Sit Shakti. That is Jada Shakti. This is Sik Shakti. Jada Shakti is used as an instrument by the God. Like I used the pen when I needed to use it. So Lord uses his Jada Shakti and Panjapudangal for creation, destruction, dissolution and the thing. And keep it aside. That's Pinna Shakti. That means it's separable Shakti. But Lord Sik Shakti is full of conscious, full of intelligence, full of uh, sense, is inseparable Shakti. That's the difference between these things. So when we say, when we worship, there are some electromagnetic radiation comes, or electromagnetic uh, fields come. So you can Minkan the Alehal. So the people say that, why do we temple, we do recite mantras. We often heard that it creates some uh, conducive and favorable uh, electromagnetic uh, waves. I don't know whether it is proved scientifically. And even if it is proved electromagnetic waves, what is the use of us? Then we can create uh, some machine, like this, uh, what do you call it, electric tambora. We can have some electromagnetic uh, machine and it radiates some electromagnetic waves. We don't need to go to the temple. So, whenever we equate our divine energy, divine Shakti, Sik Shakti to Jada Shakti, we should be careful. Because those are different. In temple, there is no electricity and electromagnetic waves was coming there. And uh, you know, people say, uh, and traditionally, we go to the temple uh, without shirts, males. They say it's to, just to absorb that electron. Energy. Then, what for the females? Shirt is considered as a status symbol. Angavastram is considered as a status symbol in our tradition. Even the last generation, whenever we see a respectful person, we take our Angavastram and get it around our waist. That is a showing our respect. Same thing we observed in the temples. Nowadays, it's, it's not considered the status symbol. So that's different. So like that. So these are the small, small things I need to clarify and... Uh, uh, supplement the information, but it was great and um, 
It's not to make any, uh, what do you call, comments or the mis uh, what do you call, say that is wrong, this is right. It's just further discussion of what we have been hearing uh, in this gathering since yesterday. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. Namaparvati Padayim.